let's go then to uh, back to where we, we had last week, I think, left off with the comparison of literature around Israel with what is going on in Israel. Um, this is a unique period, the period of the wisdom writings largely focus on Solomon's period. It's a rather unique period in Israel's history, both before and after Israel is dominated by some of the foreign powers that surround them. Uh, Egypt has been one of those foreign powers. After Solomon's time, we're going to see the beginning of the Assyrian Empire, then later on the Babylonian Empire. Um, in the middle of all those empires, you also find smaller nations that surround Israel are, are creating problems for them. So the period of the judges, for example, you're going to see a lot of influence of the smaller nations that uh, God will use and at sometimes he'll actually use them as a disciplinary instrument. But what is unique about the David Solomon period out of which comes a lot of the literature that we are studying this semester, the Psalms, remember David wrote over half of them and then Asaph and others who were in David's time wrote quite a few others. You have the great majority of Psalms are coming out of the David Davidic period and and then of course Solomon is is the author of much of the wisdom literature of course we don't want to shortcut Job Job is definitely an early book very very early likely um, but the wisdom the wisdom period is a unique period in Israel why because it's during this period Israel is almost in a power vacuum there is not a lot of encroachment of these foreign nations on them and what usually happens during times of great peace is you will find that there's a lot of opportunity for the development of a rich literature. Literature often comes out of periods like this because there's more opportunity for reflection, more opportunity for writing, um, more opportunity for the intellectual interests of life rather than just survival. And so this is a unique period. Solomon is going to in, in the area of wisdom, Solomon is definitely going to play a key role. I want to take you right now to, uh, if you have your Bible there, turn to 1 Kings chapter 4. 1 Kings chapter 4 is a passage in Solomon's story that tells us a bit about his role in, in the world of his day, beyond just Israel, but Solomon's role in the world of his day. And uh, let, me, let me read the words here. And what I'd like you to do is listen a bit. To what are some observations that you would make out of 1 Kings chapter 4 that, are, um, that tell us something about wisdom? That tell us a little bit about what was wisdom in their, in their setting. I'm looking at verse 29, 1 Kings 4, 29. God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and breadth of mind like the sand on the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the East and all the wisdom of Egypt. So obviously here we have a reference to an international community. Four, he was wiser than all other men, wiser than Ethan the Ezraite, and Heman, and Calcol, and Darda, and the sons of Mahal. Now, if you're like most of us, when you read over those names, they mean absolutely nothing to you. And so we quickly read over names just like we read over gene genealogies at times. But I suspect in the original setting of this writing that these names were really well known to people. These would be considered in the international community some of the champions uh, of wisdom, some of the sages in cult other cultures that people would go to. And so as if you were listening as an Israelite following the Solomon period and during the Solomon period, you would, you would respond like this, for he was wiser than all the men, all other men, wiser than Ethan, the Ezraite. No way, nobody is wiser than Ezra if you knew who he was, or Ethan I should say. Wiser than Heman and Calcol and Darda? No way! There couldn't be anybody that is smarter than these guys. The claims here are probably comparing Solomon to the wisest of the wise. And these, 
these individuals evidently had an international fame about their wisdom. And so it's, it's, what it's saying here is that Solomon was the Super Bowl champ. Solomon was the hands down wisest man in all of the world. And then some of his accomplishments. He, he also spoke 3,000 proverbs. Now, here we have a great example of, of oral tradition. Uh, we don't have any statement here about him writing them down, but we do know that many of those spoken Proverbs ended up in the written document that we call the Book of Proverbs because they're identified as being from Solomon. Solomon probably wrote many Proverbs beyond the Book of Proverbs that we have. Um, he wrote, his songs were 1,005 songs would likely be put to music, uh, but they would especially be poems. He, would writ, he, he wrote poetry, um, just absolutely prolific in that area. Interesting section coming up. He spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. And he spoke also of beasts and of birds and of reptiles and of fish. And people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. Um, I made a few comments myself, but what are some observations you make about this passage that help us to understand wisdom a little bit better? Besides, it's an international phenomenon. Obviously, there's an international phenomenon going on here, but what, what about wisdom do you, do you understand from this? from this passage. Anyone? Are there any things in here that surprise you? Okay, Sean. Sean first and then Yuri. Okay. Yeah, the whole mentioning of all these different fields of study, trees, animals. Okay. Yeah, probably, yeah, that's a great question. How did he use information about trees, animals, birds, and other things? <coughs> in his wisdom were they examples like go to the ant you sluggard consider the ants ways and be wise yuri what were you going to say yeah knowledge of nature good here's a great example i think where the created world is brought into the discussion of wisdom um, and I don't know what comes to your mind when you hear the word wisdom, but usually we, we almost think of more philosophical kind of wisdom, philosophical statements. And yet if we understand wisdom in Solomon's day, it also included uh, the study of science, the study of the physical world, to know the patterns of animals and birds and um, plants. So we could include in the, in, in the definition of wisdom in the ancient world, we could include studies such as bot, botany, um, certainly anthropology, the study of man. We could include biology, perhaps. So wisdom is a much broader subject than we sometimes think of it because m much of the wisdom that's been preserved for us is in the form of advice about life or philosophical views of how do I understand the events of life. Whereas Solomon as a wisdom teacher was very, he was very broadly educated and he would have taught others in these areas as well. So I think if we look at Solomon's role in the ancient Near East, he was a champion. He was the best of the best but a, a wisdom teacher would have had knowledge of a great number of subjects. They were not just 
zeroed in. And, and in a way, it challenges, I think, it challenges our modern system of education, which produces specialists. If you go on in your education, even in seminary education, you're going to go on to become a specialist in something. And yet the ancient idea of wisdom included the value of being a generalist, of being able to look more broadly at all of the subjects. And this is why I think that um, uh, the, the value of, of our education comes in. Often our undergraduate education is going to be that, gen that general training. But sadly, I think in, in uh, much education today, even in an undergraduate setting, you're forced to become a specialist. You're forced to zero in on, on particular areas, and there is not that broad education that would have been true for wisdom in the ancient Near East. So Solomon, I think, illustrates for us a, a better, uh, more balanced idea of wisdom, that it included uh, expertise in all of these areas. It also included a lot of observation. Uh, for a scientist has to observe his world around him, and Solomon would have been, uh, been very, very skilled probably at doing that and then at teaching others about what that might mean. Uh, now, Sean, you mentioned uh, another good point, and that is I think it's out of this knowledge then that the animal world and the plant world become great illustrations. And you're absolutely right. The illustrations are now to teach us in another realm. So what we often see in wisdom teaching, Solomon's is a good example, we see that practical knowledge of life is going to be translated over as an illustration, um, practic I'm sorry, practical knowledge of the plant and animal world or of the physical sciences is going to become an illustration for us of how to live life. It gets back to something uh, we talked about last time, and that is this order of the universe, that God has built order into the universe. We see it reflected in the sciences. We see it reflected in the study of man. We see it reflected in spiritual areas. And wisdom is trying to bring all these together, trying to bring this, this order. The, the Egyptians called it ma'at. Remember the idea of ma'at? is that there is some kind of order in the universe that is reflective of a God who created the universe. So, um, any, any other ob observations on 1 Kings 4? Anything you see there that is helpful to us as we, as we understand wisdom? Franklin? Okay. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that Solomon, um, any of these wisdom uh, champions, but Solomon himself would have been a great communicator in some way. Um, very, very winsome personality probably but able to present this well. Later on, we're going to see other passages in Scripture that bear on the idea of wisdom. And one, one of those, that I, one of my favorite in Ecclesiastes, reminds us that the wisdom teacher not only knew his wisdom, but he could communicate it effectively with others. So being a teacher, you're absolutely right. In this setting, Solomon becomes an international phenomenon. I want to look at one other passage that reminds us of that, and it's a, it, there's not a lot said of this, but turn over, if you would, to uh, 1 Kings, Let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, chapter 10 is the visit of the Queen of Sheba to Solomon. This is probably from the area to the east of Israel, uh, Arabia, and the Queen of Sheba comes to visit, and let me just read part of the passage. Now when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of Yahweh, she came to test him with hard questions. This is an interesting expression. Um, what, what would the Queen of Sheba have been asking him? Well, I guess you could say maybe some of the mysteries of the, of the scientific world, maybe some of the things that were puzzling to people, those could be the hard questions. But I think a better way to understand this, we're going to get 
in a moment we're going to get to the idea of what were the different forms of wisdom and one of those forms was the riddle the riddle where you had a word uh, a, a wording of a statement that would take thinking that would take solving that would take um, intelligence to be able to figure out what was this story about or what is this telling you may remember probably the most famous riddle in the Old Testament is found where? Wh whose story is it? Yeah, remember the story of Samson and Delilah. And no one can figure out the secret to his strength. And, uh, and of course, Delilah is able to do that, the, the uh, cleverness of a woman to be able to figure that out. And in the story, there's a riddle. There's a great riddle uh, that Solomon uses that no one can figure out except, of course, they, eventually it is, it is figured out. What we know of other writings outside of Israel is that there were champions of wisdom and the culture actually encouraged competition so that these champions of wisdom would actually gather together in what we might call a Super Bowl of wisdom. They would actually try to out, try to out um, think one another, if you will, to come up with riddles that no one else could solve. And this was how you knew who was really, really clever and really, really knowledgeable is the ones that could do this better than anyone else. And I think Solomon seems to have this reputation. So the Queen of Sheba here is coming to test him out. She's going to see. And, um, and I'll go on here with the story, verse 2. She comes to Jerusalem with a, great, with a very great retinue with camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind. And Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. And when the Queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, the attendance of, of his servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, his burnt offerings, in other words, she's very, very impressed with all of the organization of his, of his kingdom. Um, there was no more breath, there was no more breath in her. The idea here is she was, uh, she was absolutely astounded at this. She said to the king, the report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom. But I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpass the report that I heard. Happy are your men, or happy are your people. Happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear of your wisdom. Blessed be Yahweh your God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. Uh, so this is a great affirmation of um, Solomon's international fame. Here's somebody coming from outside. We take this the story at face value. She had heard of his reputation, but now she's really impressed with who he is and, and his amazing um, organization. Well, let's go on uh, talking here a little bit about different genre. Maybe a better word is subgenre because wisdom itself is a genre. Wisdom literature would be a type of literature. What are some examples of, of wisdom? Um, I'll like, I'd like to just look at a couple of these, the, the examples that we have here. So if you have your Bible, turn to Proverbs 22.1. This is the most famous, the most famous kind of wisdom writing, and it's simply what we call a proverb. 22.1 says, A good name is to be chosen rather than riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. Just a simple by cola, and much of the wisdom in Proverbs would often be A, B, the, the, the two lines of poetry. Um, that would be a proverb. Proverbs that we'll define a little bit later as usually short statements. Short statements in some way having a quality that they grab your attention. Cleverness about them and other things about them. I already commented on the riddle a bit. Um, Sometimes a riddle may have been complicated, but sometimes riddles were very, very simple. 
in 1 Kings chapter 10. I'm going to go back here just for a moment to 1 Kings 10. Oh, that, that was a passage I referred to earlier uh, as a riddle. In a moment, I want to show you how one of, the, uh, one of the figures of speech that we dealt with also takes on almost like a riddle, and we'll talk about that in a moment. There's also the allegory. Can someone define what we mean by allegory? What would be a good way of, of defining an allegory? Okay, Sean. Yeah, uh, well, something in real life and maybe a sim symbolic deeper meaning, a symbolic meaning. It's a story, and the story is going to have a surface level, but the story is also going to have a deeper meaning. Uh, different from a parable, here's where I like to distinguish between parable and allegory. A parable, in most cases, Jesus sees many parables, as you know, he usually has one main point that is being made by the story, and the details will all contribute to the main point. But an allegory is different. An allegory can have a number of points. In fact, in an allegory, it's not unusual for every major part of the story to have some deeper meaning or some uh, symbolic meaning, if you will. So allegories are much more complex um, I'm not going to read this one right now, but one of my favorite allegories is in chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes, and when we get to Ecclesiastes, we'll be taking a look at that. The reason it's become one of my favorites, it's an, it's an allegory about aging, <laughs> about someone getting older, and it is really clever. It's one of the cleverest, well-written allegories that I've ever seen. Um, so that would be another kind of wisdom writing, a, a way that wisdom would have been written. Uh, dialogue, you may not have thought of this as a form of writing wisdom, but much of the book of Job is actually an example of this. You may remember, we're going to get to Job next, but you may remember Job starts out with a prose introduction and it has a prose conclusion. And the introduction and the conclusion are very important, but much of the book is poetry, so it's got prose, poetry, and then prose again. So we know this was, in, this was intentional. Much of the book is a dialogue between Job and his three friends. And then later on in the dialogue, God is actually going to come into the picture and he's going to speak as well. Dialogue, very much a way of that wisdom was presented. So when we read the book of Job, we read this these lengthy, ongoing conversations between Job and his friends. And I don't know about you, but I actually kind of get bored with them at times. Those conversations are so long and laborsome, and they seem to be repeating things over and over. But it was a way of teaching wisdom. Do we believe that the story of Job literally happened exactly that way? I don't think so. I don't think we have to say that Job and his friends used exactly those words when they spoke to one another. But the conversation between Job and his friends, the dialogue was put into a poetic form representing the essence of what they were saying. And that poetic form represents a dialogue between Job and his friends. Uh, it's, it's just a way of presenting wisdom. The literature of wisdom is presented in this way. And then finally, we have also the prophetic address. And Proverbs chapter 1 is an example of that number of these kinds of uh, prophetic addresses in the book of Proverbs. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you, will you love being simple? And goes on and on. Personifying wisdom as a person, making it into a person and then allowing it to speak is a technique of presenting wisdom. So we call this the prophetic address where we have wisdom presented not as an idea but wisdom presented as a person. 
And uh, you may remember that there are, are other places over chapter 8 is a famous chapter where wisdom is personified in some ways. And we're, we're taught a, a lot about wisdom just by allowing wisdom to speak. Now, let's go on to talk a bit about the leadership roles within Israel. And um, here I find it really interesting to think in simplistic terms about how the prophet and the priest and the sage related to one another. There's one leader in Israel that, who is not on this list, and that is the king. And certainly the king had a major role in leading the people of Israel. But the, 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 the three that relate most closely to one another are the prophet, the priest, and the king. And they relate closely to one another because all of them have to do with the revelation that God has given to his people. And what do we do with this? Uh, the prophet, thus says the Lord, would be a great way to picture the prophet. Amos is a great example of that. The prophet is just a spokesman for God. He is going to, now he's going to do other things too, but in the realm of communicating God's truth, over here, the prophet is going to be the, um, the way that God speaks to his people directly. The priest is going to take the revelation of God and is going to allow the people, is going to lead the people, if you will, to respond to God and to offer sacrifices and to go through the religious rituals. And so in a very real way, the prophet and the priest have opposite roles. The priest is bringing, a uh, prophet is bringing a message from God and the priest is leading the people to respond to that message in some way. Now here's where the, the sage or the wise man has a very, very different role. He doesn't necessarily reveal new truth but he takes the truth that is already there, largely from Torah, from the Pentateuch, we would call it. The sage or the wise man takes that truth and leads people in a reflective process. Leads the people of Israel in thinking about this and um, applying it in different ways to life. So the sage is not necessarily going to be saying Thus says the Lord, but he's going to take what the Lord has said and he's going to relate it in a very practical way to everyday living. And that, of course, uh, fits very, very well with the description of the wisdom literature. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, all of these have to do with how God's truth relates now to real life situations. It is a combining together of the spiritual, the practical, the revelation from God all put together in a package. This, the process of doing this, as I tried to picture here in the diagram, is taking place in a community of people. Wisdom may not happen overnight or may not be uh, revealed overnight, but wisdom is going to take some time to develop. And that's why, even though we have in the wisdom writings the final product, in a sense, of what Solomon and others wrote down. What they are writing down took hundreds of years to figure out. Uh, it is not God speaking to them, but it is rather the combined experiences of many, many people over many, many years reflecting on those experiences and coming to a series of, I guess I would say, aha moments. Aha! Look at the pattern here. Look at the way that God's truth now has been lived out in hundreds of lives. And look at the results of that. What, what, it, what happens to somebody's life if they're lazy? And they simply don't follow the commands in the law that seem to talk about being an industrious person. So the, the reflective process that's going to go on of the wise man here is not something that happens overnight. It happens over a great deal of time. And this is why this is such interesting stuff. It is very life related. The reason many of our folks in our churches gravitate to these books of the Bible is because they are, they're immediately connected with life situations. We don't have to go 
figuring out, oh, well, how does this relate to what I need or what I do? Uh, they're immediately there. The prophet, the priest, the wise man, and Jeremiah 18.18 18 actually includes a statement of all three of them in the same passage. We're all leaders in their own way in Israel. They all served, served an important role. Um, this is a question I've never thought about before, but it just came to my mind. Who would be the sage or the wise man today? Who would be the equivalent in Christian culture, but maybe even outside of Christian culture, of what the wise man does? Counselors. I would agree with you. Listening to people's issues, problems, in our Christian context, hopefully bringing God's word to bear, but trying to apply that in some practical way. Who else, what other kinds of roles or professions might fall into this category? A pastor? In, in, in what role of a... Yeah, uh, great observation. A pastor does almost all of these, doesn't he? He doesn't, he doesn't get this revelation on his own, but if he's taken the scripture and preaching it. He's saying, thus says the Lord. He's also leading people in worship to come back to God. And Sean, I'm not sure if you had in mind here, but when he interacts with people in a counseling kind of role, or even, even just in a discussion, he is serving the role of hopefully the sage or the wise man. And I think we could expand that really to a pastoral staff because often there are gifted people in different roles in a pastoral staff. To do that kind of thing. Any other kinds of people? Um, do philosophers do this? We have we have some philosophers in our in our midst here at Talbot. <laughs> Did you all hear what Franklin said? Philosophers think about questions that don't really relate to life. <laughs> yes, I, um, do all of you know J.P. Moreland? Kind of like one of our gurus of the philosophers here, distinguished professor and so forth. Uh, I felt really good. I came on faculty about the same time as J.P. Moreland. I felt really good about a year later that I finally understood something he was saying. Uh, I, I, I met in a couple of faculty groups early on, study groups and so forth, and for the longest time I had no idea what J.P. Moreland was saying. <laughs> and uh, I'm not worried about being on tape here because um, I actually told him this many times. I said, J.P., when I first got to know you, I had no idea what you were saying. And now I don't know whether to be excited or, or whether fearful that I do understand what you're saying. <laughs> but philosophers... They can, uh, yes, they can go into deeper things that may not be life-related. But I think philosophers would claim that they're helping us to ask the right questions. That's what philosophers are trying to do, trying to get us to ask the right questions. It's an interesting thought, though, to think of these different roles in our modern uh, society, in our modern setting as well. All right, let's take some of these ideas now and then and go to... Uh, several bullet points on the nature of wisdom, uh, what it is. We actually started this, I think, last time. Maybe we didn't. We, we were getting almost there last time. Uh, if we were to answer the question, well, what is wisdom exactly in the context of Israel? Um, one of the things we could say about it is it's a reflection on human behavior and how human behavior leads to either happiness on the one hand or sorrow on the other hand. And all of this is, is tied in some way with the truth of God. So we're not forgetting Torah. It's just we're not Amos saying, thus says the Lord. We're actually wrestling and grappling with how God's truth now is going to relate to different kinds of human behavior. And then we observe over a period of time 
the results of that in a person's life. So this, this is what we would call a reflective process. This isn't something that comes overnight. This takes time. And thankfully, what we have here is the condensed wisdom of many, many people before us who have for hundreds, thousands of years tried to live the truth of God. You may remember what I said about the Psalms. What's so exciting about the book of Psalms, it's a collection of the cumulative religious experiences of many, many people in many different situations. And we stand generations later uh, looking back at all those generations and we appreciate the fact that all of this has been kept for us so that we can use this. Now the same thing with Proverbs, the same thing with Job and Ecclesiastes. Um, the wisdom, the cumul cum cumulative wisdom of many, many generations brought together for us in writing. But we're then asked to take this and reflect in our own lives. Um, here's what I like about this idea. It means that God's truth is being taken both as a spiritual entity, but also it is very practical. I don't know if you all use this word very much. We use it a lot in educational circles. It's a word integration. We want our spiritual lives to be integrated. We don't want them to be compartmentalized. We want to have knowledge of many different areas, as many as we possibly can, but we want to combine that to understand the spiritual truth that God has for us in those areas. So in a university, which of course Biola University is, in a university what we would hope is happening in the Christian context is to take the truth that is being learned from many different fields of study, psychology over here, the sciences over here, the arts over here, many different fields of study and to bring those together under the umbrella of the truth of God and to wrestle with ideas that are there. In fact, this is getting a little off the subject, but it would, it would be my claim that the Christian university is one of the few places today that is truly doing this idea here of reflecting on life and trying to relate it to the truth of God. As many of you know, the secular university is forbidden to do that. Um, it's an interesting word, isn't it? University. Uh, what do you think in the origin, let's talk about just the United States, what do you think the origin uh, of the university was in our country? What did the word, what did the prefix uni mean? It means one, but one what? What did the uni, uni of university refer to? I thought I heard you say it. Close, the study of God, namely theology. Have you ever heard the expression, theology is the queen of the sciences? That was the beginning of American universities which followed the model of European universities. So in every university, starting out in America, which there was a religious base of some sort. I'm talking here about Harvard, Yale, all of your Ivy League schools now that will have nothing to do with religion or very little to do with religion. Those schools originally started out with a core at the very center was some form of theology. Now in those schools often the form that that took was a course on ethics and it was a very common phenomenon for the president of a university to teach every student who attended there a course on ethics. Ethics would, of course, be combining the truth of the Bible with how you're going to practice your, your particular field, whatever it is, law, science, or whatever. And that course was the center of their education. And then around that, they would go on to take the other courses that that were specialized courses in their areas. Um, there's a great expression, and I, I'm forgetting the book that it came from, that says we, we no longer have universities, we have multiversities. 
there is no longer this unified core or thought because, and here's a, here's a I think a mis misinterpreted idea in our culture that has removed us from this, and it's the idea of separation of church and state. In the name of the separation of church and state, any secular organization that has a school is not allowed to bring together religious truth with the study of other fields. The only ones who do that effectively, in my mind, are a school like Biola University. And that's why I will, I mean, it's not just because my kids went here. I will argue all day long that a Christian university is not here to indoctrinate, but it's here to do exactly what education was supposed to do. And that is to expose us to how various fields of study relate to the study of God. Uh, and now, of course, many people would feel like that's indoctrination, but it was originally at the heart of what a university was, was supposed to do. So going back to the point here, wisdom is what a Christian university seeks to do today. And that is to um, explore many different fields of study using the truth of God as a part of that, of that ex exploration to understand it a bit better. Your um, question I asked you a little bit earlier related indirectly to a discussion question that most of you did. Some of you didn't have the chance to work on this. Um, let's talk about it right now, and we'll take a break right after this. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life. 